But when we realize that we are in Christ, our identity when we belong to God is the same yeah, as Jesus Christ. We have his authority, we have his power, and we have the ability to overcome, even when it doesn't seem like we can. So join me in praising for the blessing of the power of overcoming when we lean into the Lord. Overcome.
Holy Spirit is present. So I'm going to bring Brian up. Brian is our guest speaker today. Um, and brother, we're glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. Okay. Uh, for people who don't know where Pastor is and Christine, they're on a retreat, a pastoral retreat in beautiful Green Lake, Wisconsin. And they're going to, right? That's good. They're going to be there all week. Um, so it's good when the pastors get a break. But um, we know this guy. He's been here before and we're very excited. So, Pastor, thank you. Take away. Um, you. You know, I, I'm just uh, so honored to be here. Uh, I have a heart for small churches. I actually got saved a little evangelical congregational church in Willow Springs, 104 Spring Street. It's no longer there. It, it actually caught on fire. But often, there was maybe five or six. A good group would be 12 people on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And this pastor drove from, he lived at a trailer in Wheaton, and he drove all the way down to pick us rebellious teenagers up. <laughs> and uh, he did this for years. Favorite. I don't think he even had a salary. I don't know how he supported it. But he worked He worked at Youth for Christ in the mail room. But that little church, uh, here I came. I'm a, I'm a chaplain at Cook County Jail. And there was a missionary that came out of there that, that uh, worked his whole life in aviation fellowship. And I just have a heart for small churches. And uh, so who knows? Who's in this church? It's going to be a next pastor, a next missionary. You know, I just excited. And uh, your worship is so cool. Father and son, right? On the, on the dueling piano, is that right? Is that, I mean, man, that's just, that's just really uplifting. Thanks. And I've been praying for this church 10, 15 years before I even set foot in this church. Uh, I live right here in Lamont. And every time I would go past this, I would pray for this church. And then about Oh, maybe seven, eight, maybe ten years ago. My daughter lives right down here on High Road. So now I go past it like two, three times a week. So every time I go past, I ask, uh, Lord, bless this church. Lord, let this church be a lighthouse in Lockport, Lamont, and Chicagoland. And I pray for Pastor Troy. And uh, so I just have a heart for, for this church. And uh, I'm just so honored to be here. Well, I want to share with you. Uh, as I was thinking, you know, my favorite thing in the Bible, I love eschatology and end times and, and seeing all these pieces fitting into place. But I thought, you know, let me try to put something really hands-on, something practical, one thing that you can take away today <coughs> that I hope will help you. Uh, and, you know, relationships are really difficult. Uh, like, just like Pastor Troy, I'm a Moody grad, and uh, when I was going to Moody, I have every movie grad has to do an internship, so I chose Pacific Garden Mission. And uh, they would let me speak at the noontime service, but there was hours in between where I, I didn't do anything, and I said to the, uh, to the pastor, I said, hey, could, is, I, I want to do more. I really want to make this internship useful. Because I'll tell you what, I'm going to have you counsel all the men in our Bible program. So as the homeless people come in, and they hear the gospel and they want to change their life so they can enroll in this Bible program. And it's a discipleship program. So I want you to counsel each guy. I'm going to bring guys, groups of three down. I want you to counsel them. I said, well, I don't know anything about counseling. I've had a counseling class in my life. And he goes, hey, you have a Bible, right? And I go, well, yes, yeah. so just use that. So they would bring down groups of three and I would counsel them. And, and uh, one thing I found out, it was amazing. <coughs> Every single man in that men's Bible program had a problem with relationships. They had a problem with other guys. You know, they're all sleeping together in, in a homeless shelter, and uh, they all have jobs to do it, and they were constantly having problems in their relationships. So I learned a lot that summer in my internship. And you know, relationships are really difficult. Uh, in a marriage, in a marriage you have two people who are sinners, they're living together, they're coming together as one, and it can, it can be difficult, as my wife can testify, to get along with their spouse. And you know, I, we, John and I were talking downstairs. In, when, in the fall, when man fell, one of the results of that uh, is, is this marital conflict. You know, if Eve, he says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And I've thought for years, I thought, oh, 
woman just desire, oh, my desire is to be with my husband. That's not it at all. <laughs> I thought that's what it meant. No, they want to rule over each other. They want to rule the roost. And so this marital conflict is part of the fall. And of course, we just have our sin nature. By nature, uh, we're self-centered. That's our human nature. And, you know, we are in Christ and we have a new creation, but that sin nature can pop up. So I want to give you, it's such a simple tool, uh, help you, it will stop any argument in its tracks before it gets out of hand. You know, we just had this uh, hurricane a few, well, a month or two ago, two couple hurricanes, and you might have saw the news where these, some of the dams broke, and this release of the water just coming down like a flood took everything in its path. It says in Proverbs uh, 17, 14, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. See, so it's a point in your argument. If you can stop that argument before it starts getting out of hand, and when it gets out of hand, it's like that dam that breaks and that water just took out houses and trees and, and uh, destroyed everything. So I'm going to give you a really simple tool. Uh, it always works. It's based on biblical principles. It will help you in relationships with your spouse, family relationships, work relationships, and basically every relationship. And it's such a simple tool. So here's the, the tool. Terry, please. This is the key verse, Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. Can, can you say that with me, Proverbs 15.1? A, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Stirs up anger. Sometimes they get mixed up with strife. They have different versions. But yeah, this, this verse is a key verse in stopping arguments. Um, I think this was maybe 15, 20 years ago. My beautiful wife and I were having an argument. And we're, it's, it's getting out of hand. She's raising her voice, I'm raising my voice, and it's really getting out of hand. And she's getting madder, and I'm getting madder, and, and it's escalating. And I look at her face, I can see the anger in her face. And then she's clenching her fists. And I'm looking like, this little silver-haired grandma wants to go to war with me. <laughs> and, and, and the louder she gets, the louder I get. And we're right there in our kitchen. We're right there in our kitchen, and it's getting out of hand. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit brings, puts in my mind, a soft answer turns away wrath. And I looked at her, and the anger in her face, and the fists are clenched. She's ready, she's ready to go to war. And all of a sudden, I said, sweetheart, I love you. I don't want to argue with her. It was amazing. Her fist unclenched, her face softened. She looked at me and says, I love you too. I don't want to argue with you. We hugged and we made up. To this day, 15, I don't even, 20 years ago, I don't know how long it was, neither of us can remember what that argument was about. We can't even remember it. But I remember that the Holy Spirit intervened and just destroyed, just Put a wet blanket, put a fire extinguisher on that fire as it was getting out of hand. And that, this verse, this has helped me so much. And I, I taught high school, I taught carpentry at Martin East High School in Cicero. And you know, carpentry, I don't get all the academic students, I get the average students. The students who, you know, aren't into the academics. And sometimes Cicero, there was a lot of gang problems, still is a lot of gangs in Cicero. So now you put 25 boys, high school, 15, 16, 17 boys, you put them together in a classroom with tools that can be used as weapons. This verse has helped me so much to fuse arguments. <laughs> Strife between me and another kid. You know, I would always shoot up a prayer, God, give me wisdom how to handle this. And sometimes that soft answer would just turn the whole tide. Even my principal, he was evaluating me. His name was Frank Serate. He was evaluating me. And he would come in twice a year and, and see how I'm doing as a teacher. And he remarked afterwards we had our, you know, we had a meeting and he discussed, you know, how I need to improve. But he said, you know, I'm amazed how well you handle these kids, because these are pretty rough kids. You know, it's a, it's not it's not uh, the academic ones. And he said, I'm amazed. And I said, Well, you know, Frank, a soft answer turns away wrath. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's good. And he writes it down, he says, 
I'm going to use that at the next faculty meeting. And I said, well, it's actually from the Bible. It's not from me. It's from the Bible. Uh, David, King Solomon, Solomon wrote that, uh, King Solomon. And uh, so, yeah, this, this, this really works. So uh, we're going to look at three principles or three examples of this. Uh, Judges, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now let me give you a little background. Judges is a difficult time in Israel, okay? There's no king in Israel, and everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And that's a theme throughout Judges. And they have this cycle of sin in, in Judges where God blesses the people. They're following after the Lord. He's got this umbrella of protection around them. They're following Him. They're serving God. And what happens? They get prosperous. And prosperity leads, oh, well, we don't need God in our lives. And, and God removes that umbrella of protection. An enemy comes in and overtakes them, takes their crops, and makes them servants. And, and they cry out to God. God sends a judge, raises up a judge, delivers them. And then they start following the Lord, and there's some umbrella of protection. And uh, then, of course, they be prosperous, and they fall away. This happens over and over in the cycle of Judges. So we're in the Judges. Uh, the background, Gideon, he's the fifth judge of Israel. Now, if you remember the story of Gideon, he had actually like 20,000 people in his army to go defeat the Midianites. And he does the whole thing with the fleece and all that. And, and God assures him, he raises up this huge army. God says, that's, that's too much. And he whittles it down. And finally, he's left with 300 men. See, if, if Gideon went in there with 20,000 soldiers, they would say, oh, you know, we delivered... We delivered ourselves from, you know, we did this, but no, when there's 300 men against all the Midianites, you can, you know, God gets the glory. There's no way that they can do this. So, Gideon's pursuing the Midianite army. The men of Ephraim, they're angry with Gideon for not inviting them to help. And look how Gideon, this is amazing, how Gideon handles this situation. Let me read Judges 8, 1 through 3. Then men of Ephraim said to him, What is this thing that you have done, not calling us when you went to fight against Midian? And you look and says, They contended with him vigorously. They're really, they're really, really angry with Gideon. But he said to them, Listen to how Gideon handles this. But he said to them, What have I done in comparison with you? Are not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebenezer? So let me, uh, let me kind of break that down. They had a law in Israel, part of, part of the things they would harvest their, their grapes and their crops once. Anything they left, the poor could come and they could glean. So imagine they harvest the grapes, but they left some on the vines. Now they're overripe. Maybe they're turning brown. Maybe they're getting shriveled up. And he says, hey, aren't the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebenezer? Ebenezer is um, where Gideon lived. That was his hometown. And then he says to him, God has given the leaders of the Midianite, Orb and Zeb, into your hands. And here's this soft answer. What am I able to do in comparison to you? So he just, he just hey, you, you, you know, your gleaning grapes is better than the fine grapes of, of my hometown. You guys did this and this. What's that? What am I in comparison to that? And you look, it says their anger towards him subsided when he said that. So that soft answer turned away wrath and avoided. They were, they were content. They were really angry with him. So we see how that works in Scripture. That soft answer, giving a soft answer, turned away their wrath. Now the second example is different. This is Judges 12, 1 through 4. So we're going to fast forward 80 years into the future from Gideon, and um, we're going to look at the second part of Proverbs. A harsh word stirs up anger. So now we're in uh, the ninth judge. His name is Japheth. He's had a difficult childhood. He's the son. He's the son of a harlot. The Bible says a prostitute, a harlot. And so he's got half-brothers, and his half-brothers drove him out of the house and said, hey, you you're, don't have the same mother, you don't belong in this house, so they drive him out because they don't want to share 
their inheritance with him. So I don't know how old he was, but they drove him out of the house, probably a teenager or something. So he's on his own. He's had a rough life. He's going to answer differently than Gideon's. He's had this difficult life. So Japheth, he takes this tiny army from Gilead, and he's pursuing the sons of Ammon. Uh, that's modern-day Jordan. Even the capital of Jordan is Ammon. I don't know if you say Ammon or Ammon. So um, Gideon was pursuing the Midianites. Eight years later, we got a similar situation. Japheth's pursuing the Ammonites, or the sons of Ammon. And uh, here comes Ephraim. They're angry with Japheth for not inviting them to help. Notice how Japheth handles compared to Gideon. Uh, Judges 12, 1 through 4. Then the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they, they crossed the Sephora, and they said to, said to Japheth, sorry, i gotta, I got to get this a little closer. Why did you not cross over to fight? Why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? When they say cross over, it would mean cross over the Jordan River, the uh, western boundary. And they say, hey, why did you cross over? Why didn't you call us to come fight with you? To, to help you to fight. And then they're pretty upset. What's their, what's their thing? We're going to burn your house down with you in it, basically. So we're going to burn your house down on you. Now here, Japheth could have handled this with a soft answer. Japheth said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver me from their hands. When I saw that you wouldn't deliver me, I took life, my life into my own hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon. And the Lord gave them to my hand. Why then have you come up against me this day to fight against me? And Japheth gathered all the men of Gilead and fought Ephraim. And the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim. So here we have it. Hey, here we are 80 years later, not uh, the same guys. Ephraim come like, hey, why didn't you call us to fight? And Japheth says, hey, I, I had called you. I invited you. You guys didn't show up. I had to go at it myself. And they're, they want to burn this house down. So his harsh answer, I can imagine, they're probably shouting at each other. Japheth gives that harsh answer. Flip down to chapters, uh, uh, the next line, Judges 12, 6. Yeah, as a result of this, this is astounding to me, 42,000 men of Ephraim died. Thus there fell at, at that time 42,000 men of Ephraim. See that harsh word stirs up anger. 42,000 people needlessly died because of the harsh word. Gideon sued them. Japheth gave him that harsh answer. Stirred up strife. And I started thinking, wow, what, what can I compare 42,000? So I googled I asked uh, Google, what is the population of Lockport and Lamont? And Lockport and Lamont, the total have about 44,000. Wow. So a little bit smaller. So can you imagine, that would be like today, everybody in Lockport, everybody in Lamont is killed in this battle, except for about 2,000. 42,000 puts it in perspective. That could have been avoided if Jacob would have gave a soft answer. So yeah, that harsh word stirs up strife. All right, let me give you the third example. This is in 1 uh, Kings chapter 12, verse 3, 3 through 14. This is uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Here's the background. It's about 931 B.C. Now, if you remember, we had the first king of Israel. That was Saul. He, uh, he had some issues. Then David took over. Then David's son Solomon, prosperous time. Solomon, they say that silver was as stones, silver was as common as stone. Solomon takes over. Solomon dies. He leaves his son, Rehoboam, in charge. Rehoboam, Rehoboam he wants to meet. He's just ordained or just crowned the king, taking over Solomon. He goes out to meet the people with a meeting with all the people of Israel. It's one kingdom now. It's united. There's no north and south kingdom. It's one kingdom. Uh, let me just read here. Then they said, this is uh, chapter 12, verse 3 through 14. Then they said and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yokes hard. Now therefore, lighten the hand of service of your father and his heavy yoke, 
which he put on us, and we will serve you. Then he said to him, depart for three days and return to me. So, okay, he, he meets with the people. He's just crowned as king, coronated as king. They said, hey, you know, your father Solomon, he really taxed us hard. He's, he made our lives bitter with these taxes and getting so much money out. So could you ease up a little bit? And we'll be your servants. So he said, give me three days to think about it. That's a wise, that's a wise thing. So he consults. He's got the younger advisors, and he's got the older advisors. So the people departed. Uh, what is it? Verse 6. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father, Solomon, while he was still alive. How do you counsel to answer these people? Now this is the, uh, this is the elders. This is the older the advisors. Something about being older, you get wisdom. Uh, not so much when you're young. You think you have wisdom, but you really... And then you get older, you're like, wow, I really thought I knew everything. I didn't know anything. Now that I'm older, I still thought... And in my 40s, I thought I knew everything. Now I'm in my 60s. But. So here's the older speaking. Then they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people, and will serve them, and grant them their petition, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. So, hey, speak kindly to them, ease up a little bit on their burden of taxes, and these people will be your servants forever. You know, that's, that's a wise word. So he goes, all right, all right, thanks. Let me check with the young guys here. Verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the elders, which he had given him, and he consulted with the young men who grew up with him. So these are guys about his age, uh, grew up with him and served him. Verse 9. So he said to them, What counsel do you give that we may answer this people that have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father put on us. So now here's the, here's the young men answer. Old guy said, Hey, lighten up a little bit. These guys will be your servant. Here's the young men who grew up with him, spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yokes heavy. Now you make it lighter for us, but you shall speak to them. My little finger, my pinky, is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, I will discipline you with scorpions. Then Jeroboam and all the people came and returned, returned to me on the third day. I'm sorry, I missed the line here. Then all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, and as the king had directed them, saying, Return to me on the third day, the king answered the people harshly. There's that word, a harsh answer stirs up strength. He answered them harshly. He forsook the advice of the elders which they had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. You will discipline me. Uh, I will discipline you with scorpions. So, man, he gives them the wrong answer. He gives them this harsh answer. Now, this is 931 B.C. This harsh answer stirs up strife. And then, yeah, the result. Here's the result. <clears throat> Kings chapter 12, verse 16. When Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, what portion do we have in the house of David? We have no inheritance with the sons of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. So Rehoboam's harsh answer, harsh answer stirs up anger, strife. For the next 209 years, Israel is divided to the ten northern kingdoms and the two southern kingdoms. From that day forward, it all started on this day when he gave him the harsh answer. Hundreds of thousands of people would die because the northern and southern kingdom are constantly at war between each other for over 209 years. And then the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom, took them away, and much later Babylon came and took the southern kingdom away. So that harsh answer caused a civil war between the northern and southern kingdom. If he would have just listened to the advice of the elders, 
that the kingdom, they could have saved that kingdom and stayed together. But for the next 209 years, they're constantly back and forth fighting each other. You know, um, there's this college in Ohio called Kennan College, and they actually did a, a psychological research project in this college. And they found when people shouted towards someone, their natural response is to shout back at someone. You know, and they, they found out that you can keep a person from getting angry by the controlling the tone and the volume of your voice. Uh, so that's just, this whole study that you did actually proves Proverbs 15.1. Good example, has anybody ever had a call of technical support? Hello, <laughs> <laughs> may I help you? You know, and you have that, and, and you know, you tell them your problem, and they have a script. They have a script in front of them. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I have some, I have some good friends in India. I'm not mocking them, so I, have, I support actually three Indian missionaries. But, you know, they're, de they're used to dealing with angry people. I swear, every customer service, whether you're talking to the ring cameras or trying to get your computer fixed or whatever it is, uh, they all, you know, they're all overseas. Their job is outsourced. And they almost have a similar script, because the first thing, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. River. It's not for war. It's Mr. River. I'm sorry, Mr. River. I can help you with that. And they, they, give, they give this soft answer. See, they're used to dealing with angry people. First thing, they, oh, I'm so sorry I haven't come to it. I can help you with that. It calms everybody down, right? You're angry, my computer won't work, and you're really frustrated, and they come out, oh, I'm so sorry. Let me help you with that. And I think they're trained to do that. And it's, I mean, they don't know it, but they're, they're using Proverbs 15.1. Okay, so what's our application for this? Memorize Proverbs 15.1. It's 12 simple words that the Holy Spirit can bring into your mind. Just like that day with my dear wife when we're having that argument. The Holy Spirit brings that to my mind. It just cut, killed that argument instantly. Twelve simple words. Even if you only remember the first half, the soft answer turns away wrath. If you just remember that, Holy Spirit can bring that to your attention. I got one more shorter point. Uh, uh, next point, don't let the sun go down on your anger. This is for us married people. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. This is, a, this is a great verse. It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. I thought that's interesting. See, when you, when you uh, go to bed and you're angry, you give, and you're angry with your spouse, you go to bed and you didn't resolve this, before you go to bed, you need to resolve this because what happens, you sleep on it. And, and it's, it's festering. You're still kind of angry with her or with him. And, and you're festering. It's building up. And if you don't take care of it, you actually give the devil an opportunity or the devil a, a foothold. Yeah. So how, how does that work? See, when the, when the sun goes down, the devil can use that and he'll, he'll get that little, that little crack, that little foothold in your marriage where you, this, this unresolvement and if it, the longer it goes on, the more danger it becomes. It can grow into this root of bitterness. Then you start to thinking, oh, you know, you think these thoughts, and, and you start you start coming bitter towards your spouse. And that bitterness can lead to unforgiveness. And Satan can use that unforgiveness, and he'll get a little, just that little crack where he gets his foot in the door, he gets a foothold there, and he can take that foothold, that, that bitterness, that unresolvedness, that unforgiveness in your heart, and he can build a little foothold, and he can turn that foothold into a stronghold in your marriage. Uh, we had a dear friend, they were married for over 30 years, and they, they had an argument, and they had some problems in their marriage, and instead of, instead of forgiving each other, they resented married for over 30 years, and um, they didn't get in the divorce. It was so sad. Some of them, uh, two of our closest friends. So we got to really be careful. Don't go to bed angry with your spouse. That, that anger can fester, turn to bitterness, unforgiveness. Satan can get in and drive a wedge between you guys. 
Uh, I got an illustration. Terry, the next slide, please. There's this uh, guy, Dan Goodwin. This is way back into uh, May 21st, 1981. I don't know, some of you are some of you around there, a lot of you weren't. I don't know if you remember Spider-Man. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. This guy was he was out of work. He was really buff. He was a gymnast. I actually met him at uh, one of those things downtown uh, at the uh, convention for sporting equipment. He was like he was there. He was uh, just you know they hired this guy. It worked because he was out of work. He's trying to promote himself. So he did get a job. He was a speaker at the sporting goods conference at the uh, McCormick Center. So he decides. He needs a job, he needs publicity, the free publicity, he's going to climb the Sears Tower. So he studies it, and he finds that there's a crack. The crack's only about an inch and a, inch and a half, inch and a quarter wide. It goes from the sidewalk all the way up to 110 stories. And it's a scaffolding, it's a crack for the scaffolding for the window washers to go up and down on the scaffolding. So he studies the building, he sees this crack, he tapes up his hands, he starts up really early in the morning really before the, the city's bustling, and he puts his hand in this crack, and he turns it, and his hand is stuck in there, and he puts his next hand, and when he turns it, it does this hand over hand. This little crack, he's able to, to scale the world's tallest building at that time, the Sears Tower. Well, it's Willis Tower, but it's still Sears Tower to me. So, we don't want to give Satan any kind of foothold. Don't go to bed angry. Make up with your wife before you before you go to bed because you take that anger, it's just gonna fester. Interesting story. A man said, My wife and I have made a, a promise never to go to bed angry. And he says, We haven't slept together in seven years. <laughs> <laughs> well, in conclusion, Proverbs 15 1. Yeah. Memorize that. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. And then, don't let the sun go down in your anger, in your marriage. Work things out. Even if you got to stay late and talk it out. And remember, give your wife that soft answer. It calms them down. And your husband, of course, too. So letting the sun go down in anger, it gives Satan a foothold. Then memorize Proverbs 15.1. That's your, that's your work this week. Memorize it. Hide it in your heart so Satan can use that. And something I found too, uh, ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom. As I'm teaching school and these guys are about to start fighting, and even when my boys were little, my boys were little, my, I have twin boys, and the first 13 years of life they never fought once. The next five years, they fought like every day, constantly, 20, 20 hours out of the day. And so often is there arguments, oh Lord, in my heart, and I, I wouldn't say it out loud, I'd be, Lord, give me wisdom. And something would always pop into my head. Give me wisdom. What should I do? They're arguing again. And something would be like, separate them. Something would pop into my head. So when you're in this argument, this argument's just starting. I would, and, and I would do this teaching all the time. I'd shoot up a quick prayer in my mind. I'm not saying it out loud. The students would think I was nuts. Like, I would say, God, you say, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. You give challenge. I need wisdom right now. So you can ask the Lord for wisdom, you can memorize Proverbs 15.1, and uh, hopefully that's something solid, something tangible that, I can, uh, that I've imparted to you that the Holy Spirit can use and help you in your conflicts. Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> let, me, uh, let me close this in prayer. Well, let's bow our heads in our heart. Father God, first I want to thank you for this church. Lord, I thank you. I know this church has been around for years. Thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for Pastor Troy. Thank you for these dear people, Lord. And I pray that you would help them apply this concept to your life, Lord. Uh, to their life, I mean, Lord. And that you would uh, use this verse to, to help them settle arguments before they get out of hand, Father. Uh, bless, these, bless this congregation. Bless Pastor Troy. Thank you for a faithful man of God. And I ask you to bless this church. That out of this church you would come missionaries, chaplains, pastors, so that you would use this church as a lighthouse to the lost people around them. Lord, thank you for what you're going to do in this church, Lord. Thank you for your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 James 1, verses 19 and 20. 
So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There are times that I have to remind um, myself, in particular, just because offense may be offered, and we've all faced people who are just trying to antagonize, yeah. doesn't mean you have to accept the offense. Yeah. You don't have to go, oh yes, thank you very much, and here's your portion back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy, it's easy to fall into that trap. But as Pastor said, when we stop, when we are slow to anger, God has a way of extending grace upon grace. And sometimes the hardest part is letting him give us that grace. Because in our flesh we want to go back, well, you so and so. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's very understandable. Mm -hmm. But I love this next song that we're going to sing because it really boils it down to brass tacks. Trust, yeah. obey. It's not hard, it's not complicated, in the sense that it's hard to understand. It's hard to walk out, but it's pretty simple. Just trust God, obey His word. So please join us in singing, Trust and Obey.